This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ephraim Graham. A busy day in the news. We want to get straight to our top story. Iran is threatening revenge against Israel for an airstrike in Damascus on Monday that killed a key senior Iranian military leader who is reportedly deeply involved in terrorism. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story from Jerusalem. The attack on the consulate building in the Syrian capital is considered an attack on sovereign Iranian territory. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the blast that killed General Mohammad Reza Zahidi, along with his deputy and five other Iranian officers. General Zahidi was a commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force and a key figure in Iran's proxy war against Israel that provides training and weapons for terror groups in the region. Zahedi and his deputy reportedly meeting with those leaders inside the consulate, likely planning further strikes on Israel. Iran is threatening a harsh retaliation, and Hezbollah said the enemy would receive punishment and revenge. CBN News war correspondent Chuck Holton says Iran doesn't want a one-on-one -on -one war with Israel. They want to continue with this proxy war through fighting Israel through the Houthis, through Hezbollah, and through Hamas. That includes sending weapons to terrorists inside biblical Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank. Israeli forces operating in the territories discovering weapons shipped by Iran. Massive amounts of explosives. They're starting to find mines, landmines, hand grenades, rockets, uh, light anti-tank weapons, all sorts of uh, weapons like that. And that bodes very poorly for Israel. If a force the size of the one from Gaza that struck Israel on October 7th came out of Judea and Samaria instead, the destruction and death toll could be much worse. Because it basically surrounds Jerusalem on three sides. If 1,500 bad guys had come across into Jerusalem and started going crazy, they could have easily killed a lot more people. They could absolutely wreak havoc in Jerusalem, the capital city. In Gaza, Israel says it's investigating the death toll of seven international aid workers reportedly killed in an Israeli airstrike in central Gaza. The IDF said it is making great efforts to enable a safe passage of humanitarian aid and is working in full cooperation and coordination with the WCK organization to support their efforts to provide food and humanitarian aid to the residents of the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, U.S. State Department and Israeli officials met for two hours in a video conference call to discuss Israel's impending invasion of Rafah, Hamas's last major stronghold in Gaza. The White House said the two sides agree on the need to destroy Hamas and Rafah, but expressed concerns over the risk to innocent Gazans. The Israelis agreed to consider those concerns and hold follow-up discussions. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. I want to continue our coverage now with Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joining us from Jerusalem. So, Chris, Iran is threatening a harsh response after this strike in Damascus. Chuck Holton talked about some of their possible actions against Israel. What else might Iran do? Well, Ephraim, but I would also say, as Chuck did say, that use their proxies could be Hezbollah on the north. Uh, Hezbollah could increase its attacks. They've been uh, firing rockets into uh, Israel since uh, right after October 7th. Uh, the Houthis strike could be coming from southern Israel. They've been trying to hit with uh, UAVs or long-range ballistic missiles into southern Israel. They could trigger some of their Hamas sleeper cells uh, around uh, not only in, uh, in around Israel and the region, but also uh, they could could have global targets. And, and I think Iran is making it clear they could take their time to retaliate, and, but you can make sure that they are plotting how and when and what to do to hit Israel. Uh, as uh, Julie said in her report, this is the most senior Iranian eliminated since October 7th. And not only him, but several others uh, is a very, very big blow to, uh, to Iran and its plans here uh, in the Middle East, probably the biggest one since General uh, Soleimani. What are your thoughts on how Israel will prepare for Iran's possible retaliation? Well, right now we know there's high alert in the northern uh, Israel. Uh, 
anticipating possible attacks by Hezbollah. Uh, certainly, there's going to be increased security for Israeli embassies worldwide. This was uh, in Damascus. This was the building just adjacent to the Iranian embassy. And you can imagine that their diplomats are going to have increased security. Uh, you know, Iran is responsible for an attack in Buenos Aires uh, back in the 1980s. And so, as I said, this is probably a global uh, concern for Israel how and when Iran may attack and uh, retaliate for this alleged uh, strike by Israel. Israel is promising an investigation into the death of, death of an aid worker in an Israeli airstrike. What can you tell us uh, about that? Well, the IDF is yet to provide the results of their investigation. They're saying the investigation is going up to the, to the highest levels. Uh, it's likely perhaps to come out soon today. Uh, they took about a day after an alleged bombing, you may remember, right after the war began, again, from, uh, of a hospital in Gaza that allegedly killed 500. Uh, the real story came out just uh, about a couple of days later that wasn't Israel, it wasn't a hospital, but it was a parking lot. Uh, tragically, uh, dozens died, but not hundreds, as originally was reported. Also, uh, you know, just earlier today, I've seen video on social media that looks like this might have not have been an airstrike, but a mortar. Uh, but we uh, will we'll certainly wait for the results of the IDF investigation. Uh, but it could be a Ben Hamas and uh, not the IDF. You traveled to the Israeli Knesset today where they talked about the Abraham Accords. What did you learn? Well, you know, despite the war, and it's almost six months uh, after October 7th right now, the Abraham Accords are actually holding quite strong. Uh, and you can actually measure that, uh, that strength uh, in increases in trade or tourism or not dramatic decreases. Uh, and one of the uh, Knesset members who led the, uh, this particular caucus was saying one way to preserve the Abraham Accords is to make sure that Israel defeats Hamas, and uh, because victory or defeat is going to reverberate through the region. Many of the Abraham Accords countries, they also see, like Israel, that the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas are their enemy, too. And uh, there at the caucus, there was a U.S. delegation led by Senator James Lankford from Oklahoma. Uh, he talked about the cooperation, the importance of cooperating with Israel and the uh, Abraham Accords nations. We also heard the fact that this is really a crossroads of civilization moment where the civilization, Western civilization, and many of these Abraham Accord nations are, it's a time of choosing exactly which way they're going to go. All right, Chris, what's ahead this evening on Jerusalem Dateline? Well, we have an interview with Ambassador David Friedman, uh, the former U uh, U.S. ambassador here to Israel. He's going to discuss what impact the U.S. abstention at the U.N. about 10 days ago, what impact that's having here in the region. We have a story on the humanitarian aid reaching Gaza. The question for many is, is the aid getting there? And once it gets there, where is it going? We'll have an update on the uh, current situation here. We also have two stories. One is about the road to Emmaus. That was the, uh, the story there in after Jesus rose from the dead when he encountered his disciples. Uh, so we'll have a story on the road to Emmaus and also a story on the garden tomb service in, uh, in the garden tomb here in Jerusalem on Resurrection Sunday morning. All right. Lots to look forward to. Thank you so much, Chris. Always, we appreciate your insights. Want you to stay safe. And we back here are praying for you and the entire team there in Israel. I want to remind you at home that you can see the latest from Jerusalem Dateline tonight on the CBN News Channel at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or you can watch it on YouTube. Here at home, new questions circulating about Russia and the mysterious affliction known as Havana syndrome. After a five-year investigation, a new report says all evidence points to the Kremlin. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke has that story. For years, many suspected China as the culprit behind mystery attacks, leaving U.S. officials with health issues like nausea, severe headaches, seizures, and even blindness. Now a CBS News team from 60 Minutes reveal new evidence pointing to a Russian intelligence unit. This does sort of feel like the kind of thing that's not out of the scope of the possible with Russia in particular. According to CBS News, producers obtained a document linking an elite Russian intelligence unit to acoustic energy weapon testing. And they report proof that a suspected member of that group was in Tbilisi, Georgia, at the same time Americans there complained of Havana syndrome effects. It's an attempt to sort of cleverly put pressure on competitors 
or to make people fear Russia in some other way, to remind the world that Russia can reach its tentacles far and wide, or maybe it's just a Russian intelligence agency a little bit out of control. Michael O'Hanlon with the Brookings Institution says the weapon believed responsible for these attacks is attractive because it largely has no signature. In the case of sonic, uh, you know, weaponry, it's a little bit less easily documented. There's a little bit less of a trace. There's not the same DNA signature or chemical signature or radioactive signature. In 2022, CBN News spoke with a victim of Havana syndrome. The 26-year CIA veteran says he was in a hotel room in Moscow near the U.S. Embassy when he woke up with vertigo, ringing in his ears, and nausea. I spent a lot of time in some, some really tough places in, in our war zones. This was the most terrifying experience of my life. Um, you know, basically because of, of the unknown, but, but something really, really bad happened to me that day. While many questions remain about Havana syndrome, who's responsible and the motive behind the attacks, O'Hanlon says he's certain those speaking out about their symptoms are telling the truth. The people who believe they've been targeted are pretty credible people. It's a lot of American diplomats, for example, who have been based in Cuba. And I have absolutely no reason to think that they were interested in making this up. Washington is divided over who could be behind these attacks. In 2022, the CIA reported it did not believe Russia or another foreign actor is responsible. The director of national intelligence echoed that assessment just last year. Still, the retired army officer who led the Pentagon investigation agrees all evidence points to Moscow. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Coming up, as the presidential race heats up, author and pastor Dr. Tony Evans talks about kingdom politics, how believers can navigate this contentious election season. We're going to hear from him when we come back. As the presidential race heats up, well-known author and pastor Dr. Tony Evans hopes to help believers navigate this contentious political season. In his study called Kingdom Politics, he highlights biblical principles for integrating politics into our daily lives. And he joined CBN's The Prayer Link program to talk about it. You touched a little bit on this about how we as, if we as kingdom citizens shine the light of God's values in our culture and in our government, then the government and culture will see more clearly. Help us to ex understand that a little bit better. First of all, let's start with the understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom is the comprehensive rule of God. The Bible is full of politics. God is raising up kings, putting down kings, establishing nations, destroying nations, setting laws, statutes, and ordinances. He is all up in the politics, okay? But his kingdom is to set the agenda for how the political realm is to operate. He even calls political leaders servants of his. He gives them a ministerial name throughout scripture as shepherds, because the idea was that men would rule on his behalf. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. When God was the government, because there was no civil government yet, he had maximum freedom. From every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. He had limited regulation. Only one tree you couldn't eat from. Then he had dire consequences. You shall surely die. That would become the foundation for how civil government would be established. He would establish the nation of Israel. He would give them a constitution. There would be 10 amendments to the constitution known as the Ten Commandments. There would be 613 statutes and ordinances, which would be the application of the Ten Commandments applied based on the constitution that he had given them. He told Israel that they were to be the model that nations should follow. So there should be maximum freedom, limited regulation, dire consequences for breaking the limited regulations. Mm -hmm. So when a government is operating that way and it is marrying righteousness and justice, righteousness being a vertical relationship to applying God's rules, uh, uh, and uh, then uh, justice is the societal application of those righteous rules, when that begins to happen, consequences tied to that, when that is broken, then you can have an ordered society. That is a kingdom approach to politics. So when we are promoting that approach, whether you're Democrat or Republican, in fact, I say in my book, Kingdom Politics, you should only be a kingdom independent, okay? Amen. You can be a Democrat light or Republican light, but you got to be at your core a kingdom independent so that no party rules you. 
Well, we know that this November, we're going to know who our next president will be. However, no matter which candidate, which wins, there are going to be people who are upset with their candidate, their, their, that their candidate, excuse me, did not win. What advice do you have to offer them? Well, first of all, we are told in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for our leaders. So no matter who, who wins, you, you should pray for local and national leaders that they will be influenced uh, to make the right decisions. But prior to praying for them, we need to pray for us. We need to pray. God is not going to skip the church house to fix the White House. He is not going to just skip God's, his own people to solve the problems in the culture. He works through his people for the benefit of the culture. So oftentimes our prayers aren't going anywhere because we aren't going anywhere. God is looking to his people to set the stage. The church, according to Matthew 16, is to be God's kingdom agent through which he operates in the culture. Ephesians 3.10 says God works through the church to deal with the principalities and powers. So if we're not getting right, if we're not unified, if we're not bibliocentric in our focus, if we're not applying consistently God's regulations, guidelines, and governances in where we live and the influence we have, then we can't expect the, 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 the culture to change. Or to put it another way, until God can fix the church, he won't fix the nation. And you can hear more from Dr. Tony Evans and get more spiritually uplifting information on this week's prayer link. It is on the CBN News Channel Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. You can also catch it on the CBN News app or you can watch it on YouTube. Still ahead, what you eat can help or hurt how you feel. We're going to bring you that story. It's coming up right here next on CBN News Watch. Mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and others have skyrocketed in recent years. New research confirms our diet plays a huge role in how we feel. On this week's Healthy Living program, a prominent psychologist recommends eating foods that help to improve our gut health. If you're feeling um, uh, anxious, you feel it in your stomach. You might have um, an upset stomach, or if you're feeling scared, you, you feel it in your gut. And the other way direction as well, if you have an upset stomach, you can start to feel very anxious about that. So they communicate, your brain and your gut communicate back and forth. There are trillions of bacteria in your gut. And what is happening is that it creates an environment where neurotransmitters are created and flourish. And those neurotransmitters then go up to your brain. We often think it starts in the brain, but they start in the gut and travel up to the brain. 90% of your serotonin actually starts in the gut, not in the brain. And so when the foods that we eat can nourish that bacteria from grow, to grow and create that environment where those neurotransmitters can flourish, or it can create what is known as inflammation in the body, and it can interrupt that connection between the gut and the brain. And that's when it can spiral into depression, anxiety, stress-related issues. And so we've seen this really exciting um, field, it's called psychobiotics, of using food, and particularly these probiotics, to help nourish our gut, uh, you know, have it be a healthy gut so that we have a better mood. I've never heard that term before, psychobiotics. I love yeah. it. So uh, this is like how your your the, the probiotics, the good bacteria can affect uh, psychology and affect your mind. And, and mm -hmm. you did mention something about serotonin and good bacteria affect your serotonin. It, that's the, the feel good hormone. Am I, am I right there or is that's, it something else? Yes. I, that's I know it's good. good. Serotonin <laughs> is good. And what I love about it too, you know, when we think about uh, antidepressants, that's what impacts the serotonin. So we are really naturally increasing and helping the serotonin to thrive, which is really exciting, particularly because, it, you know, it's and and as an aside, it's not a, tr uh, uh, you know, cure all. You know, I'm a huge advocate of eating well and also um, therapy and, you know, a multitude of different treatments. But what's exciting about it is that um, you know, eating in this way doesn't have any side effects. It's very natural. Um, it's low risk. Um, there are only a few groups of people who may have to be a little cautious about probiotics, but it's naturally found in the foods around us. So it's it's really exciting 
to know that there is a way that we can really nurture our mental health through the foods we eat. Right, so the probiotics, those are actually bacteria. Those are the good bacteria, and they're actually alive. They're actually liver, living creatures that we eat and put into our intestines, and then we want them to multiply and grow, not die. So the living bacteria, the probiotics, they're in yogurt. We know that because it says on the label, probiotics. When you go down the yogurt aisle, there are a thousand different choices, not just yogurt, but also the cashew yogurt and the almond yogurt, not even cow's milk yogurt. What kind of yogurt should we be eating if we want to improve our gut microbiome? You're absolutely right. You want to look for right on the package. It says live, and I have a few examples here, which I can show you. Live and raw probiotics. It will say right on the package. This is another example. This is kefir. This is like yogurt, but it is, um, it's a liquid, a little bit more sour in taste. We've got as another fermented food, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is a um, a fermented food that contains those probiotics. And another example is kimchi. You can hear more about what you should eat and drink as well as what to avoid when you s and to have better emotional health. And you can do that on this week's edition of Healthy Living. It airs tonight on the CBN News Channel, actually beginning this afternoon at 2.30 and then at 6.30 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app or you can watch it on YouTube. We're we'll right back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. Time now for your Tuesday Tweetable. It's a message I pray will bless you first and then you will post, tag, tweet, and bless others by sharing it in your circles of influence. Love is more than a word. Love is more than a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is action. And love lasts. Think on that for a moment. Consider the love of a heavenly father who sent his son to earth and his son chooses to die to restore an imperfect and sinful people back to a right standing and relationship with a perfect and almighty God. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online, cbnnews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at cbn.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make it a great day. We'll see you back here same time tomorrow. Goodbye, God bless.